Hey, welcome back to I Am, the podcast that explores the possibilities and potential that we can access as human beings. I'm your host, Johnny Wilkinson. The power of the body and our relationship with it, I believe is one of these immense avenues, one of these doorways for accessing different experiences of life in fast moving ways. It's one that I hope to keep exploring through these podcasts too. Today, we're gonna look at it through the lens of nutrition and some associated lifestyle opportunities. We've had plenty of inquiries about this and there's gonna be more of it to come later down the line too. But our central focus for this one is the gut microbiome. And it's something which is becoming a massive part of my life in more than one or a few ways. So I've been speaking to Dr. Rory Robertson. He's a microbiologist with a strong background in human nutrition. And you can hear plenty from him on the upcoming guest podcast. He was such a good sport for humoring all my idealism whilst providing that much needed scientific perspective. Just to let you know that I always release an episode early in the week, a few days before the main guest interview becomes available. And in this sort of 10 to 20 minute slot, I attempt to set the scene for the upcoming conversation and share some of my own ideas and thoughts as well. I'm really enjoying hearing from anyone listening in. So if something arises in you, thoughts, feelings, or anything that you feel you want to know more about, do not hesitate to email me on hello at iampodcast.co.uk or just leave a comment in the review section on Apple Podcasts. I hope you get to enjoy Rory's insights and the light that he shines on what I consider to be a really important subject and opportunity. Take care, look after yourselves, I look forward to catching you soon. My name is Johnny Wilkinson. This is the I Am Podcast with Dr. Rory Robertson. Dr. Rory Robertson, how are you? I'm very well, Johnny. How are you? Yeah, outstanding. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to have you with us and yeah, a chance to explore something that actually I'm really, really excited about. And just for those listening, how would you describe your field, your speciality and what it is that uh, drives you in life? So I am a, a microbiologist, but with a background in human nutrition as well. And so I've been lucky to be involved in the nutrition field at a really exciting time when we're all interested in what is known as the, the human microbiome. So that refers to uh, all this collection of trillions of bacteria, fungi, viruses, and all these organisms that are, are living inside of our body which until recently we viewed as being really harmful towards our health. But actually with recent science over the last number of years, we've realized they're actually essential for, for our health and, and our body in so many different ways. I study that as a scientist in a lab and I examine how all of these trillions of microbes inside of our body interact with our own cells to affect our health in, in a, vari a variety of ways. So uh, yeah, call myself a, a microbiologist, but uh, sometimes a nutritionist and yeah, it depends what day you ask me. <laughs> nice. Well, the good thing is you certainly cover a ton of areas there, which are, uh, I think, hugely important. And one of them that you just sort of alluded to there, I think already is that there's a bit of a shift in the way that we see our bodies and the, the way that we see our environment, the way that we see that interaction. For me, that's been really, really important. My initial way of seeing everything, I think, that built up in me was of that separate nature, that real kind of individual, distinct existence where there's me and everything else. And I wonder if that's something that's changing now that's becoming a bit more of an integrated systemic view of everything that's bringing about a different kind of relationship you're like more of a compassionate view an understanding view a more accepting and curious view about all these things which when you say them like fungi and bacteria it used to sort of trigger that repulsion in a way whereas now is that shift coming is that what's big in your world absolutely yeah i, I mean you don't just see it in your world and you see it in science now as well as people viewing things as systems rather than an isolation and rather than viewing one organ in isolation rather than viewing one scientific pathway in isolation, we realize that human bodies and ecosystems and everything else work as systems and they all interact in combination to create their desired uh, function or, or their benefit. And so that's exactly what I'm studying as well. You know, we used to look at 
individual bacteria in isolation and say, oh, that one causes disease. We need to eliminate it with antibiotics, for example. But really, we have this whole ecosystem inside of us, this kind of jungle that is constantly interacting with each other, interacting with our cells. And so we need to have this kind of holistic view of science and how our body is kind of interacting as a system rather than individual views of one organ, one bacterial species or, or whatever it is in our body. That's really interesting because even just looking at it from a sport perspective in, in my old world, where the individual gets in the way of the team, if it's viewed that way. And the more there comes about this understanding that the barrier between me and everything else kind of expands and also starts to include everything else as me. Because like you said, as part of an ecosystem, you remove one part and all kinds of things you know, really fall apart. We don't understand the importance of everything and how it interacts. But it's, it's a really interesting look at also how we've been going about things and looking for that answer to every problem, that kind of yes, no, black, white answer in, in the, the medical side, but also in terms of when you've got a problem whether it be existential or team where you just look for that straightforward, simple, I just need this, that one pill fixes everything. What's the most kind of surprising thing for you in this world of microbiome? What is it that excites you about it? The potential that it has to impact medicine and, and impact health. Right now, there's a lot of excitement there, but we're only just kind of at the the, the tip of the iceberg of discovering what is really happening inside of our bodies as we interact with all of these different organisms inside of us. But there is huge potential for this knowledge to be used to create different medicines to treat everything from colorectal cancer, let's say, to improving sports and, and performance. But we need a little bit more science to, to do that. And I like your analogy of kind of the individual and the team, and that kind of is quite relevant to where we are in this field at the moment. There's a huge amount of focus, for example, on probiotics. And people think that in all circumstances, if you add in this one single type of bacteria, this one probiotic, it's going to be this golden pill that will solve everything for you. When really it's not the case, you know, only in certain circumstances and in certain disease states will that certain type of bacteria, that probiotic, have an actual beneficial effect. And it's probably quite similar in your case in sports as well. You know, if you add in one fantastic player, uh, they aren't going to transform the worst team in the world or a team that has kind of fundamental problems within it as well. And it's really those interactions and how these different players within a team or bacteria within an ecosystem interact with each other that really will lead to that optimal performance of that team or of that um, ecosystem. So looking at health and what I used to think was health was a real sense of what you could do physically. It's, it's crazy when you look back at it to think that it became so focused about what it looked like from the outside. You know, this is what a healthy person looks like physically in terms of, you know, musculature or, or just any of that kind of stuff. And I understand that there's little parts of that that come, but they're inspired by health, not attained by aspiration almost. And that was a really challenging place to be, but also what it meant from in terms of nutrition, as you alluded to at the very beginning, was that it just was there to serve a purpose. It was there to achieve something. And therefore, I had quite a, a block view of nutrition, you know, very the simplistic, and it went through all kinds of stages. Fats are bad, fats are good, carbs are great, oh no, sugars are bad, and all this kind of stuff where it was all just so surface level, quite rudimentary, and it didn't have any of the subtle kind of nuance to it. But now I think health has got a bit more of a feel about what we can experience, about feelings, emotions, uh, relationships, and what I can perceive as opposed to what I can look like and how I can be seen. And even as much as I just want to live longer, it's now about what kind of experience is our life. And how does bacteria microbiome fit into that? Because at the moment, you know, the idea I had was that, oh, you eat this, your enzymes break it down. It puts this in the body. This is recovery. This is building muscle. This is energy. So where does gut microbiome come into that? I think you've touched on a really important point here that nutrition is, is very context specific and, and people want a simple answer and, and they want you to say, 
always eat this at this time, no matter who you are, whatever, and avoid carbs or avoid fats or whatever. Whereas we as humans aren't very good at putting things into context and, and thinking about individual situations. And in certain situations, it might be good to restrict uh, carbohydrates down to a, a certain level, or it might be important to eat less fats or, or whatever. But we all need to think of our own bodies and our own individual uh, circumstances. We can all follow general nutrition guidelines, which are aimed to try and create a, a guideline, I suppose, for an entire population, which is quite hard to do because we all have different disease states. But really, we have to look at our own health, as you mentioned, in the, the larger context of not only our own physical bodies, but also psychological and physiological well-being as well. And so I think what's really interesting about my field in, in the microbiome is that we now have to realize that we're not just nourishing and feeding our own bodies. We have to really appreciate that anything that we put into our body or anything that we're doing for our health is feeding this entire ecosystem that is inside of us. So we have to remember that what we've discovered in this field is that actually there are more bacterial cells in your body than there are human cells. There are roughly you know, 30, 40 trillion human cells. There is at least the same amount of bacterial cells, and way, way more viruses, fungi, and all these other organisms. So collectively, our whole beings, our whole selves uh, are not just human. We're, we're more microbial. And to date, especially in the nutrition field, but also in the larger context of health, we've kind of neglected maintaining and optimizing the health of, of this other half of our body. Uh, so when we think of nutrition, we're just thinking of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins that we need to feed our own cells. And we know the pathways about how our own body breaks these down and, and provides us with, with energy to conduct our daily functioning. However, we really need to feed these microbes as well. And, and so, for example, people in the UK only have about 18 grams of fiber on average per day, whereas we really need to be taking in 30 grams a day. And this is because our own human bodies don't have the enzymes to break down fiber. If we didn't have bacteria and all these other microorganisms in our body, the fiber would pass right through. And instead, this fiber goes down into our large intestine where it's broken down by all the, the microbes inside of our gut to then produce interesting chemicals and really healthy metabolites which pass into our body. So when we're eating, I suppose we need to have this holistic view that you're thinking about that we're not just feeding ourselves. We're feeding these other organisms inside of us, and that is going to have a, a really positive effect for many aspects of health that we, we can talk about more. So these bacteria and, and all different organisms that are inside of us, then they're responsible for you know, producing all kinds of chemicals out of those things, which have such an effect upon our life experience, or certainly seem to be in some way responsible for certain areas. And there's also this understanding about the gut being that second brain almost, can you bring that into context a little bit? But looking at when you're talking about these bacteria cells, that there's as many as there are human cells in a way that what makes up at least half of us is not even us, but has its own incredible intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. There's this really exciting field which shows that our gut and brain is connected in a huge number of ways. And I think you've described it well there in the previous view that we had of, of these other organs inside of us not being us, but, but we do need to actually consider them. They are us. They're not another being. We aren't just humans. We are now what should be described as holobionts. We are a kind of walking ecosystem ourselves that is an environment that houses both human cells, but also a huge diversity of other life as well. Uh, and so this exciting field that has kind of come about in the last uh, number of years has shown that our intestines, where most of these bacteria are present in our body, is both physically and biochemically connected to our brain and, and to our spinal cord and all parts of our nervous system uh, in a huge number of ways. So firstly, our, our gut and our brain are physically connected through hundreds of millions of nerves, which pass uh, from the brain, the spinal cord to all the other organs in the body but a huge number of them connect uh, to the gut. And there's one particularly large nerve called the vagus nerve, uh, which is critical for sending both messages from the gut up to the brain, but also vice versa, from the brain down to the gut. So a good kind of example of that is if, if ever you get nervous, maybe before a big game, before an interview, before a presentation, most people then need to go to the bathroom. They start finding something in, in their gut. We start getting butterflies in our stomach. Uh, and that's a, a real physiological symptom of this brain gut connection. You know, it's our brain that is getting nervous and getting anxious and it's sending signals down to our gut. 
But what I suppose the, the big revelation in this field is that these signals actually get sent the other way around as well. And, and that maybe what's happening inside of our intestines can actually send messages to our brain and change the way that our brain uh, functions and works. Uh, and that is because all of these organisms inside of our gut, they produce hundreds of and, and thousands of different chemicals, which then can either pass into the bloodstream and make their way up to the brain, which can send signals through this electrical network and through all these neurons and these nerves um, and, and in a variety of, of other ways. Uh, so one example of this is some of these microbes, these bacteria or the cells in our gut can produce certain chemicals called neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters literally mean brain chemicals. You know, these are chemicals that usually work in the brain. They make us feel happy and sad. They make us feel stressed. Uh, and these can actually be produced in the gut. Uh, and one of the examples of this is serotonin. Serotonin is nature's antidepressant, really. It makes us feel relaxed and calm and, and happy. 90% of the serotonin in your body is actually produced in your gut. Now, uh, uh, the serotonin has other functions in the body just to make you feel happy and sad in the brain. It, it can do other really interesting things in the gut, like make your intestines move properly to pass things through. But this just shows that a huge number of these chemicals, such as serotonin or another one called GABA, can actually be produced in your intestines and, and send signals to the brain to, to change the way that we think and feel. Uh, and that could potentially have implications for long-term health of your brain, thinking about maybe Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or long-term brain health, or even just short-term day-to-day brain health from stress and anxiety and all these things that we all experience now in our modern lives. It's really cool because not actually that long ago, there was only one or two centers out there that were talking about nutrition as being a possible contributor to exploring improvement in mental health. And it was almost kind of ridiculous. It felt like you could dismiss it so easily because so much of that space has been dominated by correcting you know, thought patterns and psychological stances and belief systems and whatever. And of course, that's enormously, enormously important. But it's so nice to see that science is actually creating a real structure for which this actually works. And, and the other thing I find really nice is to understand that there's another intelligence which can inform the brain and it's that kind of idea about in being inspired and being an intuition and the heart informing the brain as opposed to the brain kind of telling the rest of the body exactly what is and what life looks like and i'm really interested about this because depending on whether you call it a chemical balance in us or the energetic makeup or just the kind of mood we might be in everything can look so different one day it looks like this, the next day it's the same circumstance, but it looks different. And that is a really difficult shift to get behind when you're in a logical, deductive process of seeing life because it's all in the mind. But just being able to open up that mind and explore this opportunity and allow that state to change. Because when you're at your best and you feel in that mood, the sense is anything is possible. That is, for me, a sense of being connected to your potential is that that creativity, that sense of exploration it's so important that creating that environment for allowing those kind of feelings and connections and and relationships to flourish. And it brings me to a feeling about what that microbiome is, creating those conditions for something to flourish without, as you said before, from the mind perspective, saying this is what will flourish if we put this in here and this in here. But having that more open view towards it is seeing the gut microbiome as a kind of environmental soil almost for something. Does that fit in any way? Uh, I think it absolutely does. It's coming back to this idea that it's, it's an ecosystem. You know, I like to describe it as a, a jungle or a, a coral reef or something that is a larger ecosystem that has a huge number of species within it. Uh, and then you have to add on top of that that we are housing this ecosystem. And so we could view it in a variety of ways. Either that is the soil for us to grow out of, or we are the soil for, for this ecosystem. And so it's, again, this interaction and this cycle that is, is so important that we aren't viewing things in isolation. We're connected to this continuously through this ecosystem that is changing day to day, depending on our different environments, depending on our age, depending on our, our disease state. And viewing this kind of collectively is, is so important. And I think what's great from my field is finally the science is 
catching up for us to be able to understand the complexities of, of all of this. And when we think about nutrition and psychology or, or neuroscience, or whatever it is you want, you want to think about in terms of mental health, the issue previously is that these are two of the fields that are most prone to nonsense, really. They, they can be so subjective. They can be uh, so prone to uh, non-experts or, or people kind of jumping on them to um, create falsehoods. And I suppose now we're starting to understand through proper science, through proper ways of studying the body in different circumstances, how nutrition and how brain health are, are properly linked in, in different ways. That's what's really exciting about this field. I mean, there's examples now of specific diets which have been tested through proper control trials to reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression in people cl clinically diagnosed with depressive states. Or there's really interesting insights looking at how certain viruses or certain microbes inside the gut can be linked to even things like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. We might have had these ideas before, but really now it's the science that is taking out these individual pieces of the larger ecosystem and putting them into context of our health. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Just with all of that and what you were saying before about the second brain having this ability to, to pass the message up to the brain, it brings to mind the expression listening to your gut. To sort of build on the gut microbiome, I've been hearing about how individual it is, I guess, examples of that ecosystem. Of course, we share bits, but also we don't. How can one set of identical twins be so different in their microbiome, for example? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, genetically, humans are all about 99% similar. You know, we all might look different and be different in, in variety of ways through our personalities or, or looks and everything but we're 99% genetically similar. However, if we take this other half of our body that we've been talking about, our microbiome, even identical twins are only about 60% similar to each other. And so if you and me, Johnny, we're even less similar to each other in, in our, our gut microbiomes. So our, our gut microbiomes are shaped uh, in a variety of ways, mainly through a long time through our general environment. So we accumulate this organ at birth from our mothers. And there's interesting evidence shown that maybe whether you're born by C-section or whether you're born by a standard delivery, you might have a different makeup of microbes from the word go. And so from the point of us being born into the world, we acquire this coating of microbes, which over the course of the next few months of life, it begins to grow and expand into this whole organ inside of us. And then over time, as we become adults, uh, and we kind of become a bit more independent, it's shaped by everything around us, predominantly our diets. It's also shaped by the people that you live with. You know, the people within your own household uh, have much more similar microbiomes to each other than a neighbor, for example. So, you know, by the time that, that we're adults, it's really that our kind of exposures to your overall environment that is, is what shapes this. And of course, there are ways to, to change your microbiome through diet, through certain medications, through your exposure to the environment. And so these are ways that scientists are exploring how to change uh, your microbiome if you are unhealthy in some way, or if we do change the microbiome for good or bad, can that affect the brain? And can we study that? Or if we change the microbiome for good or bad, can that affect things like the way that our body can break down lactic acid, for example, and so we don't get cramp. And so there are, there are a huge variety of ways that all these different organisms can affect our body. And so there are ways of maybe systematically changing them if your environment for acquiring them isn't, uh, isn't optimal. We hear so much, I think, as a common message on these chats and these podcasts about the energetic exchange almost that's constantly going on. And, and maybe on a another level, it might be information exchange. On another level, it might be an actual physical exchange. It sounds like here you're talking about microbiomes are also involved in this. You know, like you said, the environment you interact with. Uh, the people you interact with. Uh, so what is the key to giving it a chance? Because I think I've been very much uh, perhaps a victim of a lot of routine. When I was younger, I ate the same stuff you know, all the time. And I hear that certainly diversity is a big factor when it comes to this microbiome. Yeah, you're completely right. Again, it, it depends on the age and depends on, on the situation you're in. You know, if you're a professional rugby player, there are, of course, nutritional needs that you need to think about 
maybe before considering all these other holistic parts of your body. You know, you need to have the energy to play an 80 minute game. You need to uh, do everything else. So when we're kids, starting off at the youngest age, and if you're a parent, for example, and you want uh, your, your child to have an optimal microbiome from the word go, the best thing you can do is exclusively breastfeed that child as is recommended for six months of life. And children who are exclusively breastfed have a, a way different microbiome to those that are, are bottle fed for the first few months. Uh, and they acquire all these really healthy, important microbes um, from, from the first few months of life. And then, you know, as children, if we're thinking about the environment, there's fascinating evidence shown that kids who grow up with pets or kids who grow up on farms, for example, have way less allergies than those who grow up in the kind of hyper clean, sterilized environments in big cities that, that we live in today. And this is because they acquire a huge, diverse array of microbes from their environment, from the animals around them, from the farm they're living on or from their, their pet, for example. And, and so then as we become adults, you've tapped on it. And that's exactly right. That the biggest key that we can give at the moment for nutrition is diversity. Because if you think that we have this ecosystem of thousands of different organisms inside of us, these are like thousands of different plants and trees and animals within a, a jungle or within a garden. They don't all live on, on the same food. You know, you, you wouldn't feed a, a insects or a, a tree the same as a, a tiger or, or something <laughs> that, that living within this larger ecosystem. They all require uh, a different sources of energy. And so we uh, in the nutrition field, and not only in the nutrition field, just as individuals day to day, are probably guilty of too much monotony in, in our diets and going to the shop and buying the same thing every day because of familiarity. You know, people might think that if they want to go to the gym and they want to be strong and they have this picture of health, then they need to have their chicken and their broccoli and their rice every night and that'll make them healthy and strong. But this isn't good for this other half of your body, uh, all of these microbes inside of you, because you'll only be feeding a, a small subsection of them. And really, you need to be changing up all those different sources of food and providing as many different sources of food as possible for these. And it's particularly diversity of plant foods because plant foods have all these different fibers in, which are the fertilizer or food for, for our gut microbes. They, of course, can feed off of animal sourced foods as well. Uh, and in some ways that that can be good, but their main energy is, is from plants because they break down this fiber. And when I say plants, I don't just mean fruit and vegetables. I mean, nuts and seeds and beans and, and anything that hasn't come from an animal. So that is probably the, the best tip that you can give is, is focusing on that diversity. So what I say to people is when you're going to the shop, try and buy a new fruit or vegetable or nut or seed or spice that you haven't bought. And every time you can do that, you can start building up on that diversity. Or try and hit this somewhat arbitrary, but somewhat good number of 30 different um, plant-based foods per week. And that sounds like a, a crazy number, but if you add up your olive oil and your different spices and herbs that you use and your different fruits and vegetables that you eat, you can eventually track that. And so that, uh, from a nutritional perspective, is, is probably the best thing we can do. But there are also specifics on fermented foods and probiotics in certain situations, which I can talk about, which can be beneficial. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll make sure we get to those as well. But the, so it, it's really interesting to me to hear about the diversity because so much of that mirrors or even just blends in nicely with the journey that we look at when not talking about the nutritional physical in that way, in terms of transcending old closed belief systems, which can take the form of that like and dislike. So you hear a lot of stuff about comfort zone out of comfort zone allowing accepting and all these kind of things which come against the nature of that habitual kind of urge or reactivity or craving almost that sort of sends you down that same route and it's really interesting to see that as you said experimenting exploring saying yes to things which sometimes come as an immediate no and just giving things a chance because Actually, like you said, 30 a week is doable, but it, it also doesn't surprise me that it feels like a reconnection to the planet, what you're talking about. You're getting closer to the source, the diversity, the abundance of what's around us. As you mentioned, pets. I'm presuming, you know, that as a young child as well, I was doing pretty well. The fact that I used to come home at least three or four times a week covered in mud. I'm talking head to toe in mud you know we had to have a special room in the house where it was the pre-shower room where you you had to get yourself prepared just to get in the shower 
But all of that stuff feels like a reconnection to our source in a way. You mentioned living in cities and that kind of lifestyle where a lot of it's convenience based. How important is it you know, to get it as close to source as possible? You know, we talk about people gardening, growing their own stuff. Is this stuff even on a level of microbiome having an effect? Yeah, I mean, we don't know for sure yet. There hasn't been good enough studies to show that, you know, if you have your own little small back garden in a city, is that as good as if you're a child growing up on a farm? But that's the kind of thing we need to know because unfortunately, or, or if you want to put it that way, that's the way the world is going. We probably are losing a lot of, of connection to our larger environments, be that growing up on a farm or, or growing up in a greener area than we do now or growing up with a, a more varied seasonal diet. You know, these days we can have anything we want and, and tend to eat the same thing all the time. So it is important. Uh, we don't quite know how important uh, it is for health yet. And that's exactly what scientists are trying to study is if we do live in these modern worlds, how can we rewild ourselves in a way that we don't all have to go back living hunter-gatherer lifestyles? You know, yeah. <laughs> You know, studies in, in my field looking at what the microbiome is of people living in Tanzania and kind of living these ancient hunter-gatherer lifestyles or people living in the rural Amazon in Venezuela who've never been even contacted by, by humans before. They've never had antibiotics. They've never uh, had kind of modern medicines. And they have the most amazing diversity of, of microbes living inside of them. And so we, we realistically can't all go back living like that, although it, it might be good in some ways. But that's exactly what we're studying now. Are there ways that we can reintroduce some of these microbes into our diets or into our environments so that we can regain some of these health benefits? Um, and, and if so, how do we do that? And, and what exactly are they? So I unfortunately can't give you a, a great answer to that. But I suppose what we can do now is make sure that we do get out in nature, for example, as much as we can, whether that's going for a walk in the park, or maybe it's rolling around in the mud or playing around <laughs> with your, your pets as much as you can. And by diversifying your diet, these are ways that we know now can diversify your microbiome in some ways. Uh, and hopefully we'll have more answers in, in the years to come about how to do that very specifically for our health. That's uh, really cool. The expression rewilding yourself, I haven't heard before, but it's a brilliant one because obviously you can see what happens when you allow a field to just sort of take its form and you, you assist it in just finding that diversity. It's incredible, the variation and the flourishing that takes place. And it's kind of a nice metaphor for the inside. The, you mentioned antibiotics and you also mentioned probiotics, which is interesting to me. I've actually got a real investment in this because what's happening in that antibiotic world, because I know it's, it's interesting when you think of antibiotics, you think, oh, well, I haven't taken that many and, and I've managed to, but actually even in the food we consume and our own kind of little infrastructures, antibiotics find their way in from other sources, presumably. So what, what's happening in that world of probiotics and antibiotics and the the sort of scientific or medical view of health as well? Is it shifting? Hopefully, yes. I mean, antibiotics have been one of the most amazing discoveries in medicine and they've been really important. They've saved, you know, millions of lives. And so uh, that is really important to acknowledge that when people have really bad infections, you, you, you'll need an antibiotic sometimes. You know, I, I had to take an antibiotic a couple of weeks ago. I had the most dreadful tooth infection that wasn't going away and I was getting an awful abscess and, and had to get an antibiotic for that. However, over the last few decades, because of this viewpoint that we had of microbes being bad and this kind of individualistic view of keeping ourselves away from all types of microbes, antibiotics became hugely overdiagnosed and hugely overused. You know, I knew some people who, if they were just going on holiday to Spain or something, they say, I'm just going to take an antibiotic. And, and so that is a, a crazy thing, or, or people that go into the, the doctor and they have a cold, and you don't want to go into the doctor and come out with nothing. You don't want a, a doctor to say to you, go home, it'll get better in a couple of days, you know, just stay home from work. You want to come out with something tangible. And so the, the doctors were kind of pressured into prescribing antibiotics, which don't work for colds. Colds are, are caused by viruses. And antibiotics just don't work on viruses. So this led to people overusing antibiotics hugely. And certainly in America, fortunately not in the EU at least, they were used in animal foods as well, kind of as a prophylactic, just in case our animals get infections, so we can keep using them for meat and so that our animals grow better. Let's just give them loads and loads of antibiotics. So that's how they've made their way into our food. So because of this, we've loads of antibiotics in our uh, environment. Uh, and in our medical practice. 
And antibiotics are, are good. If you have an infection, they'll, they'll kill a certain bacteria. However, they also destroy this beautiful ecosystem that's inside of us as well. They're like a, a kind of a carpet bomb going across this lovely Amazon jungle that's living inside of us. That will kill off the, the bad thing that you're trying to, to kill, but it'll also kill off everything else as well. And so what we're realizing is that that can have really, really negative downstream effects for our gut microbiome or this kind of microbial ecosystem inside of us. And evidence has shown that it can take weeks, if not months, for, for this microbiome to recover after a, a course of antibiotics. And in some cases, you know, if, if they're consistent over the, the course of time, particularly in early life, when this microbial ecosystem is beginning to grow, it can have really negative downstream effects on, on health as well and, and how we interact with microbes in our body. So we have to be careful only to take antibiotics when necessary. And if we do take antibiotics, there is some evidence that taking certain probiotics at the same time or afterwards can help reinitiate that recovery. Uh, and the evidence shows that it can reduce antibiotic-associated diarrhea, for example, which can be common after taking antibiotics. So that's antibiotics, um, and, and we have to be careful, use them when necessary. And, and another issue with that is antimicrobial resistance. You know, in, infections can become worse if, if we keep using antibiotics too much. Probiotics are this term for, for healthy bacteria, which are often put into yogurt drinks or into pills. And they're really interesting because they can have uh, really interesting health benefits. The issue over the last number of years is people started taking any old bacteria, throwing it into a drink or in a pill and calling it a probiotic. So much so that the, the European Food Safety Authority actually banned the term probiotic for anyone because it, it didn't have a specific health benefit. Probiotics have a strict definition, and that is that they have a live microorganism that has a specific health benefit if administered in sufficient quantities. Uh, and, and the problem was that there wasn't enough evidence for the so-called probiotics on the market. Having said that, there is really good evidence for certain live bacteria or probiotics, whatever you want to call them, to have certain really good health benefits. So there's some that have really good science for showing that they reduce symptoms of IBS. For example, some can reduce this diarrhea after antibiotics. Various probiotics can reduce the diarrhea maybe you get when traveling and then traveler's diarrhea. They can help with really bad intestinal conditions in babies. And then there's some really exciting ones that are coming onto the market, which can reduce cholesterol or, or maybe even reduce stress and anxiety to a small extent. So that is probiotics, but we just have to be careful when, when we use the term and when we talk about them, because probiotics aren't this magic pill that are going to rewild or help this garden flourish. We have to think of them as one tool in the toolbox uh, that can be used in certain circumstances or that can be used in combination with diet and with thinking about in our environment to to kind of take this holistic approach to, to health um, that we really need, not only for our gut, but for our whole body as well. That was something that was, for me, was a really big shift pace-wise initially. And I was very much somewhere else before I became curious or interested about this kind of thing. And it leads me to wonder if we feed a certain group of cultures because the diet is quite monotonous, as you mentioned, or routine based or whatever. And therefore we get a, a heavier kind of population of a certain kind within us. Does that in some way affect our food choices in terms of cravings and urges? You know, how does it come about? Because I'm just thinking if this kind of internal variety was calling out would it not call us out to say, oh, I'll have a bit of that because I haven't had it for ages. But then why do we find ourselves caught in that space of being drawn to the same thing when people are having tough days or a bit tired? I know we talk about it from an energy perspective, but why the sweet treats when you're feeling a bit anxious? Is it to do with it on a microbiome level as well? Potentially. I mean, it's probably a behavioral person that'll be able to tell you a bit more than I'll be able to. <laughs> there is... A very small amount of evidence from, you know, animal studies in a lab and looking at how if you feed flies or mice or these animals that sometimes are used in the lab, certain types of foods and you change their microbiome, can you change the preference that they have for a sugary drink versus standard water, for example? And, and there is some evidence for that. However, we have to be very cautious about that because at the moment we don't know this on a human level. We only know sure. it on a scientific level. But that suggests that maybe the makeup inside of us 
can influence our hormones in some way, can it influence this kind of gut brain connection that I've mentioned before that triggers something to make us feel a bit more impulsive or slightly more anxious or whatever it is that will ultimately affect our food choices. Uh, at the moment, we don't know this in humans. We only know it, know it from animals. But, but certainly there's interest in the variety of ways that this makeup of microbes inside of us can affect our behavior, be that food choices or anything else. One of the things I know isn't going to be of huge benefit to the microbiome is stress. Where does that f sort of fit into this? Yeah, I mean, we live stressful lives in our kind of modern worlds. We have a huge amount of chronic stress. So a kind of low level of underlying stress continuously. Whereas, you know, other people or maybe previously stress came about in peaks and troughs when there was food shortages or war or something. Whereas now we, we kind of live in this era of continuous stress all the time, be that work or just our general lives. Uh, and so when you have chronic stress like that, you have heightened levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone in our body, which always peaks when we're anxious or, or stressed. And so there's really interesting evidence now showing how cortisol, this stress hormone, interacts with our, our gut microbiome and, and vice versa. So uh, because we know of this interaction, scientists have begun studying it. So Lots of cortisol is associated with inflammation in the body. Inflammation is good when you're trying to fight an infection, but if there's lots of inflammation in the body, it's generally a bad thing because it can lead to hardening of the arteries. It can lead to high blood pressure, things like that. Uh, but it also can have implications in the gut as well when you have uh, inflammation inside of the gut. So this kind of link between inflammation and cortisol and, and the gut can have detrimental impacts on our gut. And that's why there's a huge link between stress and irritable bowel syndrome, or even stress and more severe gut diseases. For example, inflammatory bowel disease has, has some links to stress as well. If we take irritable bowel syndrome, for example, this is quite common. Up to 30, 40% of people will have some sort of functional gastrointestinal defect or disorder at some point in their lives. And this is now being reclassified as a gut brain disorder not just as a, a gut disorder. It really is this link between our, our gut and our brain and, and maybe between stress and our, our gut function that has these physiological implications for our intestinal health. So there are also ways that we can maybe look at this in reverse as well. We think about how our brain might affect our gut, but also there could be ways that if we target our gut, we can reduce stress. Again, we have to be careful when talking about this because it's all quite new. But maybe if we change the, the makeup or the composition of, of the microbiome inside of our intestines, we can optimize this electrical connections between the gut and the brain a bit better to make us feel less stressed in certain uh, situations. So, for example, some people that I previously worked with in Ireland have uh, begun studying this and say, Right, if we feed a, a certain type of bacteria, if we feed a certain fiber that's broken down by the good bacteria in the gut, can that affect how much cortisol is there or, or how stressed people get in a certain situation? And very specific fibers and certain bacteria can actually do that. They can in some way change the makeup of the gut so that when we do get in a stressful situation, in this uh, circumstance, these participants were coming into a facility in university and have to put their hand in really ice cold water or go through a stressful interview and that spikes the cortisol. But if you change the makeup of the microbiome in this way, you can actually reduce that stressful response. So definitely there are ways that we can target the gut to reduce our stress and our anxiety on a daily level. And there's more and more evidence and bacteria coming onto the market, which have, have good evidence for showing that they, they do that. And again, we need to think of this, though, in the larger context of health. You know, taking one pill is never going to reduce all of the stress and anxiety that people experience in their life. It's going to be maybe reduce 10% or 20%. And we have to think of the other ways that we interact with our environment or other aspects of nutrition or health that will help us to make up the rest of that 100% so that we can live a, a, a psychologically a healthier lifestyles. That's really cool. The thing we come up uh, 
a lot with here is the idea that to change the circumstance if they're stressful it's important you know you, you have a situation you want to make it a certain way in order for an ambition or a dream or, or what you consider to be safety and what have you but to sort of forget the work with stress as we've said you know the same situation can look completely different without the stress or with a different relationship with stress and i think for me even just listening to this to look at the idea that yes there's all these kind of things which seem so so real at the moment to, to have that kind of understanding that there's something deeper happening here which i can still also be in tune with you mentioned the tribes in tanzania who kind of having that incredible perhaps internal environment but also a very different way of seeing things maybe different way of living is there an, a thought that there's a lid, a ceiling to this? Or is it actually an open understanding of who knows, you know, in terms of longevity of life, in terms of experience, in terms of slightly more mystical experiences, brainwave activity, all these things that can bring about a very different existential reality? Is there a real reverence to the intelligence of this bacteria? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to put limits on anything because science is really there just to answer the questions that we have about the world. Science is a process to answer the unknowns. That, that's all it is. It, it's a tool. So theoretically, there's no limit to anything that we study in the body. There could be any sort of number of potential implications that our, our gut microbiomes have or our microbiomes have on, on any aspect of health or any aspect of our environmental well-being, let's say. And at the moment, we're focused on the things that we know or the things that we have hunches about, and, and we use this as a process. So right now in, in the field, people are looking at how if you target the gut microbiome at the same time as treatment for cancer melanomas, then maybe that can have a, a better effect. Or we've spoken about how if you target the microbiome in combination with other things, can that improve psychological well-being? So there's any number of health aspects that we can study but that's not to say that all of them will definitely be right. You know, sometimes we won't find a connection between the microbiome and, and something else, and, and that's okay, because we have to think that there's a huge number of factors that influence our, our health, and, and the microbiome is going to be one part of the puzzle for, for some of these. I don't know when this became more of a recognized thing, the microbiome in, in that respect, but the fact that you know, your original research is along these lines and then the awareness of something new adds to that research and presumably that's the way it works you know the awareness of something new comes in because of the technology or the individual awareness or, or desires or whatever it is and and then these things just continue to add to the picture and the picture gets bigger and bigger and more complicated and complex as, as you go along yeah absolutely and that's what beautiful about science anyway that it's the process that requires interaction and it requires learning off of other people oh, and it also requires observations from our environment you know often the biggest discoveries in in science are just from someone looking at something and saying oh that's interesting i'm, I'm going to test this uh, in other cases it's well someone showed this so maybe i'll explore that a little further and so this consistent interaction and this consistent learning off what you see in the world uh, or what you learn off other people is is what leads to the most fascinating discoveries. You know, one of the most famous scientific discoveries kind of related to microbes and microbiome is Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin, you know, and that's the first antibiotic. He was growing certain bacteria in the lab on these plates and he left to go home for the Easter weekend. Someone had left their, um, I think it was rotting apple or sampling <laughs> on, on the floor below and the kind of mold spores from this rotting fruit or food floated up into his window onto his plate and killed all the bacteria in his plate. And he observed this and thought, this is interesting. Something has, has killed that. And this led to the discovery of penicillin and, and antibiotics, which cured a huge number of lives. So yeah, that's how science works, really. It's observing things. It's thinking, why is that interesting? Why is that happening? And, and we can do that for our own health as well. You know, we don't have to look at kind of general guidelines all the time, health guidelines, say, I have to do this, I have to do this, because sometimes there's a bit of nuance and observing what happens to your own body under certain states uh, and thinking, oh, maybe if I try and tweak this a little bit or change this, that'll improve uh, uh, a certain aspect of my my health. Yeah, the, the I really 
way that this is translating through to me in terms of my world and my passions and what have you is is this kind of idea that there's all these surprising revelations do come about. And I've had that throughout my life in many ways. But the issue has always been when you then buy into that revelation, almost that the end of the search, you know, I found it and you go all in and then you find the same situation occurs where you find yourself in the same problems. But having it, like you said, as an amazing pointer and a leader in a certain direction, but maintaining that nuance of subtlety, your grounded nature in terms of the bigger picture and the openness and the unknown and everything. But using these things is just an interesting direction of shift and travel. Even with diet, with me, you know, I love this food and then I'm going to eat it for, for the next year solidly. And you're kind of like, it tastes so great. And then suddenly you're, oh no, hold on. That's also become a little bit of my problem. But maintaining that sense of balance that comes from just understanding that yeah, there's brilliant pointers and opportunities everywhere. But as you said, I don't think we're ever going to find that one pill fixes everything idea. And if we do, it could be the biggest issue we ever have. No, absolutely. I mean, humans are impatient and, and simple creatures. We always want a, a simple answer to something. And, and people ask me all the time about nutrition, but like, what is the answer? What, what should, should I eat this or should I eat this? And it's very hard as to try and explain to people. It's always complex. There's always a process. There's always a bit of nuance. And there's, there's never anything that you definitely shouldn't eat, and maybe un unless you're allergic to it. Yeah. Or yeah. You definitely, definitely shouldn't do. You know, as we spoke about antibiotics, you should take them if you have a bad infection, or you can eat your cake and your sweets sometimes, but not all the times. I'm not saying never yeah. eat your, your food, whatever it is you want. Uh, but people crave that one answer. A and so. For anything in nutrition and health, there's always a, a bit of a journey to it. And, you know, putting something in the context of our larger health is really important. Uh, and we kind of learn that over time. And, and you're not going to know the exact secret to your health right now. And that's it for the rest of your life. Because as you age, your body's going to change. You might experience different diseases. You might experience different kind of lifestyles, whatever that is. You, and you'll need to adapt uh, the way you approach your health to kind of adapt to that uh, environment. Yeah, I think just listening to you say about those new experiences that, that uh, I guess are out there waiting for us all in different ways is that e e those big things that we all buy into aren't always the great things. It's the tough things as well that we find buy into that whole kind of, oh no, this has happened, therefore it means this and that's it for now. You know, that's also the end of the search. But maintaining that kind of balance is, is so key and, and that keeps away from that relationship with stress, which I think is almost the only guarantee that things aren't going to be able to to really flourish as if we're in that chronic stress state. And I'm, I'm interested just to sort of conclude in some ways is that am I remembering things a little bit romantically through rose-tinted specs when I think of my younger days that I don't remember, you know, as much stuff around intolerances, allergies, or is it likely they were there but we didn't know them so we didn't report on them? has there been a movement with the lifestyle that we're leading as a whole, as a populace, you know, in terms of maybe slightly more industrialized and becoming more technologically driven, indoor driven, sterile? Are we finding more of these things or is it just we're better at finding them? Hey, that's a good question. But all the evidence would show to us that it is true that there are way more allergies, intolerances, asthma than we did have before. And some ways we know that's true is because in certain environments, in certain parts of the world, like some of the ones I spoke about previously, or places where they aren't as industrialized, even though we do have the tools to study these things now, you still don't find these allergies and as, as much asthma or as much of these intolerances as we do in our kind of more modern lifestyles. And that's because of what I spoke about previously. If when we in early life, our bodies need to learn to adapt to bacteria and learn to adapt to microbes. And so our immune systems need to be trained to learn, this is a healthy bacteria, this is fine, we need this. And they also need to learn, well, this is an unhealthy bacteria, our immune system needs to learn to fight it. So when we grow up in these environments where maybe we're exposed to lots of antibiotics, where maybe we're exposed to a really hypersterile environment, where we're born by C-section and only formula fed, and the combination of all these things kind of uh, changes that interaction with the microbial world. 
so that when we get a bit older, when we do have an exposure to an allergen or a certain type of food or a certain bacteria or something like that, our bodies go into this kind of uh, hyper-responsive state and that manifests as allergies or it manifests as asthma. And so that's what's happening in, in our world, unfortunately, is that we've kind of destroyed this interaction and this relationship with, with microbes and um, so that our bodies are kind of responding to that in, in an awful way. And there's a fascinating movement to try and restore these disappearing microbes that are almost becoming extinct. You know, previously we had trillions of different types of microbes living inside of us. And now over time, as generations go on, there are less and less different types of microbes living inside of us. And it's almost like a kind of extinction event that we'd see in the natural world. Uh, and, and in the kind of food world and in the environmental world, People have looked ahead at this and thought, well, if the world destroys itself, we need to have a, a safe bank of all the seeds in the world so that we can reinitiate uh, the environment and growth. And so there's this amazing freezer built into the permafrost in northern Norway, I think in Svalbard, where they've kept as many of the different types of species of seeds around the world in little vials in this frozen storage so that if we do all die or there's a big nuclear explosion, we can restart the world again or restart at least uh, food. Uh, and so people have tried to do the same for the microbiome as well. And they're, they're really starting to do this, taking all the different types of bacteria that live inside different people from all around the world and storing these in a permanently frozen place because we are so afraid that we are having such a damage to our bodies. And over time, we are losing all of these really important microbes, which ultimately are, are having these negative effects on us. So hopefully, you know, we, we might be able to reduce this burden of allergies and asthma and other diseases associated with our narrow diversity microbiomes by restoring them with these kind of preserved species, maybe in the future you know, that are there for us or maybe for our kids and grandkids. There's so many sort of parallels are coming up in my mind about the sterility and the idea about comfort zones and kind of routine and, and not exploring your vulnerability and getting out there and and facing your, your challenges and facing your fears and such difficult stuff. But again, without it, you know, like we don't learn to adapt in that space you're talking about. And it sounds really interesting that everything you're talking about, what's happening on the inside in terms of physically, it seems to have, for me, a, a relationship with something that is so important as a growth in terms of potential mental, uh, more mentally and emotionally on that level as well. The other thing I think is interesting, just as you're talking about that extinction event, is that it feels like we could all serve each other by having some really great varied diverse diets and then getting out there and sharing some of our biome with each other you know and, and into acting with each other in that way because i feel like there's a feeling that as an individual you kind of oh the problem's so big there's not much i can do but on a level there's so much we can do with what you do on the inside if you create this incredible environment on the inside if, if you're willing to explore your challenges and face those vulnerabilities and create this openness and this inspiration intuition that's happening on the inside then it's serving everyone the same way that I guess it serves everyone on the opposite to, to close your mind and say, this is how it is. It serves, but maybe not in the same way. What sort of world do we envisage in the future? What is it we long for? What do we want to see? Do we want to see all the same kind of flourishing plants and ecosystems? In which case, you know, what are we doing on the inside to to explore the same thing? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an hour and a bit of us chatting and suddenly it's like ah i get it you know for me this is what it was i think has been all about you know, like a really nice moment to feel like you know i'm not impotent in this i'm not looking at people being like oh you guys should do this it's like no i can do everything i need to do within me and let that be the the change i'm wondering well, yeah, what's this done for your experience of life all this research it must be difficult when you go and see things happening in front of your own eyes and you know it to then go home and be like oh i'm just gonna do this now has it brought about a more conscientious approach to everything or, or more balanced or how's that been for you? It, it can be overwhelming when you're in the science field because when you get a little bit of knowledge, you think then that you know a lot. But then when you get a little bit more knowledge, you realize how little we actually do know. That's brilliant. I'm, we need to hold that comment. That's a brilliant, a brilliant statement. It's so true. And, 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 that, and that's kind of... As scientists go through the, your career, you just learn more and more that we know less and less uh, about the world and, and about our bodies. So in that sense, it can be overwhelming. 
But in another sense, that's what's beautiful about the scientific process is, is we all just take it one step at a time and we all learn off each other's findings and we learn off observations in the world. And so if you can appreciate the, the knowledge about human health is only slowly being learned over time, step by step by next finding after next finding, then we know that we're ultimately going to have a, a growing and increasing beneficial effect on, on our health in, in a number of ways. And we just have to be, to be patient to, to accept that and kind of enjoy the process. Brilliant. Rory, mate, it's been fabulous. Time has flown by. Thank you. Thank you so much for your passion and what you do. And, and like I said, it's inspiring. And there's a brilliant message in there for, for everyone, at least of all, just the opportunity for people to live healthier, longer lives with, it was such a, maybe a, a different relationship with this amazing thing. Yeah, the universe we live in. But yeah, it's so cool. Thanks for your time, mate. Thank you very much, Johnny. So that's it for another episode of I Am. It's brilliant to be sharing this unfolding experience with you all. If you'd like to get in touch with either me or the guest, then all the information you need is in the show notes. I welcome all and any feedback. I really want all of you to have a hand in guiding the feel of this show and the path of the conversation as well. So just keep them coming in. But until next time, I'm Johnny Wilkinson, and this has been I Am. I Am.